Please turn again now in your copy of God's Word to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. You can find that in the church Bibles on pages 927 or in the large print that will be 1172. 927, 1172. First Thessalonians chapter 2. Moving along in our study. While you're turning there, just a, 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 a note about how we have the new, new horizons are out. They're on the table, available out there. Um, you can pick them up and find some encouraging articles. As it so happens, this wasn't planned, but the, the theme for this issue is scripture memory. You're saying, ah, ha, ha, God, I get the point. Um, but it is truly a privilege when we can come before our Lord that we can hold God's word in our hands and study it together as we intend to do this morning. So please turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Starting in verse 1, we will read this morning, finishing at verse 12. Give attention again now to the reading of God's holy word. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered, and been shamefully treated at Philippi. As you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, not, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you. Like a nursing mother taking care of her own children, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil, we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. You know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you to his own kingdom and glory. So far, the reading of God's word. Would you pray again with me now? And yes, Lord, you have called your church. We pray this morning that you would call every ear, every eye, every heart to be set, not on the words of men, but on you, the God who tests the hearts and who instills faith by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Emily had been checking her email religiously for weeks. It was her senior year of high school and her other friends had already received their letters from the colleges they had been applying to, the acceptance letters they so desired, and Emily was still waiting for the college she so desperately wanted, the program she so desperately needed in her mind. She was waiting, and March goes by, and April is slipping by. And then one day in April, Emily, after refreshing her inbox for the 12th or the 20th time, in a row, saw a new subject line. You have a new message on your application portal, and her heart began to race. Emily instantly logged onto her portal and found the letter right there. Her eyes scanned for the first line, and it read, Thank you for your application. After careful consideration, we regret to inform you. The rest of the words just seemed to fade away in unimportance. All the flattery about the number of strong applications that year, all of the encouragement to try again, 
next time didn't really seem to lessen the pain for her. Emily had been rejected. I think you know at least a little something of how Emily felt. Maybe it wasn't a college application that was rejected for you. Maybe it was a relationship in which you were told by the other person, this just isn't working out. Or maybe it was a, a relationship uh, in your family, your, your mother or your father, who maybe not in so many words, but just by persistent neglect showed, I, I don't really care that much about what you think, about who you are, about what you do. Maybe it was that promotion that went to him or went to her, but not to you. Or maybe it was still worse, that notice that you were being let go altogether. Maybe it was just something as silly as an awkward silence after you made what you thought was a great joke. Why did it hurt? Why did it hurt? It hurt because we desire acceptance, affirmation, and approval. In fact, I'd go so far to say this morning that we were actually designed to seek approval. That's actually a part of our human identity. It's woven into what it means to be a human being. The question is, whose approval should we seek? Whose approval? It's a question that many hardly stop to think and ask for themselves. It, an Instagram influencer may have 20,000 or 200,000 followers, but who are those followers? Who are they? Why do their opinions matter to them? Conversely, there are some in, in this age of, of online presence and performance, and an age that we all live in, no matter what your, your views of social media are, notice this, that there are those for whom social media becomes an exercise in anxiety. Because every post becomes an existential crisis. Will people like this? Will, what happens why they're not liking this? Does anybody care about this? Does anybody care about what I say, what I do? Does anybody care about me? And if that's not your experience, know this. It's the experience of thousands who are sitting and standing around you in your life. Especially for those who find all of their identity based on other people's opinions. They're bound up. They're longing for approval any way they can get it. They want to be longed for, accepted, approved, affirmed. They're not alone. The Thessalonians, I think, had a longing for approval and acceptance. In fact, I think they had a concern, as we saw last time in the week before, Lord willing, as we've been looking at this letter to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians, Paul is writing to a church that is under attack and assault. In fact, it was a church founded through assault. Paul himself had been rejected by the city officials and run out on a rail. And the Thessalonian church there in Thessalonica are now looking around at each other and saying, we are being rejected by our culture. What was it for? Is it worth burning this bridge with my significant other, with my father, with my mother, with the political authorities? Is it worth it? They're maybe asking themselves, was this just a message from a man who left when the going got tough? I think Paul was aware of this. And that's why part of how Paul designs this letter is, in a way, as an apology. Not, not a sense of, I'm sorry, but as a defense. An apologia, a, a defense of his ministry as an apostle of Jesus Christ. Sent by Christ, for Christ, to take Christ's people out of darkness and into the light of the kingdom of God. So Paul you remember last time, began not with this apology, but with a celebration of the work that had been going on in the Thessalonian church, now moves from that celebration to this defense of his ministry. And not just his own ministry, but it, remember the ministry of Silas, Silvanus, and Timothy as well. These gospel ministers who were far away from the Thessalonians, how did the Thessalonians know that this was legitimate and true and worth the sacrifice and the rejection that they faced? Well, Paul tells them in the text we have this morning. But he does so in an interesting way. 
Again, as I think we saw last time, we, we can't read too much into the Thessalonian situation. We can use our imaginations, but, but the Bible doesn't give us the letter from the Thessalonians, right? We don't know exactly what they were saying, but we can get a glimpse of what they might have been thinking from what Paul himself says in the way that he begins his apology in the negative. And, and he actually does this throughout the passage, but we'll just focus on it in the beginning of this message here Let's look at the way that Paul outlines what could have been empty ministries, empty ministries, vain ministries to the Thessalonians. This is something Paul is drawing as a distinction from what he actually did. He says, well, here is what I did not do, Thessalonians. Here is what you did not see from me and from Timothy and from Silvanus. The first thing that Paul points out to them is that they did not see a cowardly ministry. A cowardly ministry. He says to them that they did not come to please men. He says to them they did not come in a sense to, to kind of mealy mouth, show up, say a few things in whispers in secret. No, they came, Paul will say, and we'll look at this in a moment, with boldness, he says, to proclaim. Now, how could it have gone otherwise? In fact, maybe how did the Thessalonians experience it otherwise? You know, there were other uh, religions in the day. There were other sideline religions, mystery cults in the day of the Thessalonians. They would come into town. They would proclaim some new mystery, some new idea, some new philosophy. But of course, if you're a traveling salesman of new mysteries, you want to be careful about who you upset. A good salesman is never going to try to step on his per per prospective client's toes. And so what would a cowardly ministry look like? Well, a cowardly ministry is one in which someone waters down the truth because others don't want to hear it. They water down the truth. Maybe they still give the truth. Maybe they still give it to some people, but not to others. And they they neuter it, they emasculate it, they castrate the truth because they're afraid of how others are going to respond to it. Now, now this is not saying that we can't be careful in how we approach people with the truth. Speaking the truth in love requires an awareness of the context into which we're speaking, it's something that Jesus was keenly aware of. He was fierce when he needed to be fierce, and he was gentle where he needed to be gentle. And he is that way with you, Christian. And it is up to us as well to, to follow in like manner. And as we speak the truth as Christians, to do so in a way that, yes, is aware and considerate, but is true. Not coward. Not afraid of what people think. Not not gearing up to water down the truth. That was not how Paul came to the Thessalonians. But you notice there's another way that he did not come to the Thessalonians. He says, we did not come to you in error. Our appeal to you. You can imagine Paul is, is appealing before a jury in a courtroom. The Thessalonians are that jury. And his appeal, you can imagine, as sometimes happens in the courtroom, you have these these lawyers who are making these appeals, and they've, they've got it wrong. Now, it's their job to make the best case that they can, but they're mistaken. And they're appealing in an error. And, and sadly, at times, because our justice system is not perfect, their error gets traction and acceptance, and the jury votes on it, on an error. On an error which may send a man to his death. Well, what's on the line here for the Thessalonians, whether or not this is a truth or it's an error, it's their eternal souls. Not just their reputations before Caesar, but their very lives, their livelihood is bound up in this. And then also this whole question of what's going to happen to them if they endure persecution at the end of the tunnel. If they were to be taken out into public and stoned, what would be the benefit for them? Would it all be for an error? There are plenty of people out there in the world who believe things with conviction. And strangely enough, even still today, our culture does seem to put a virtue on bare belief. They believe in themselves. Of course, uh, it only takes a few moments to realize that just believing in yourself is not a virtue. You need to be true. 
You need to be believing in something that's worthwhile and right, not an error. Believing in racism is not a virtue. Believing in discrimination, believing in violence, believing in oppression is not a virtue. Our society would recognize that. But do they recognize that then the question becomes, well, what is truth? Is there really something that's true? Or is it all just a bunch of errors being peddled by the purveyors who are looking for something to gain? It was um, the British uh, journalist and writer G.K. Chesterton who once quipped. Chesterton, he's a, you've got to be careful with him. He's often wrong, but always interesting. Uh, he, he, he made a comment in his book, and this I think was very helpful, uh, orthodoxy. He was talking about a publisher friend, not a Christian, who was commenting on a man and said, you know, that man will go places. He really believes in himself. And Chesterton thought for a moment and said, you know where to find the people who really believe in themselves? The people, the shining bright stars whom no one can thwart, whom no one can defeat? It's the men and women in lunatic asylums. Belief is not a virtue, beloved. You can have great conviction and be wrong. So Paul says, I'm not coming to you just with great conviction. I'm coming to you with the truth. I'm not mistaken. There's a third thing he mentions here. What does a vain ministry look like? Not just cowardly, not just mistaken. At times, it is just outright deceptive. And again, you can imagine the Thessalonians wondering. Remember, Paul, is, he's, wherever he's writing this letter from, he's not writing it in Thessalonica. And so as Paul is removed from the Thessalonians, you can imagine them wondering, is he trying to get something out of us? And I think we understand that. We get those emails. We get those letters. We get those people who meet us at the Arco station or at the Chevron station and say, hey, I, I, I just want to say something to you. Or I just want to tell you something. And you say, okay, how much do you want? What is it this time? What are you looking to gain? And tragically, this occurs not just in religion in general, but among those who masquerade as ministers of Jesus Christ. Men like Kenneth Copeland. Men who get up before a TV screen and say, if you put your money in the box, in the envelope, God will bless you. God will bless you and make you rich and wealthy and well. I was just listening, again, this was an Instagram influencer, a, a church influencer uh, shared a, a sermon clip or a message clip. I'm not even sure what it was, but it was a, a, a woman who was talking and she said, we need to have a prayer life that doesn't ask God if you, but God when you. Because God will, if you believe, he will. And why are they saying it? Because you're going to pay them for it. It's a deceptive ministry. It's a self-seeking ministry. It's a false ministry. People inventing lies for their own gain. And Christ's sheep are sucked into it. God forbid. God forbid that someone who would presume to speak for Christ do so out of deception, seeking gain. That's what Paul thought. That's what Paul thought. And there's a final element here of this vain ministry, one that I think is related to all three of these. This cowardly ministry, this mistaken ministry, this deceptive ministry, what does it ultimately boil down to? It boils down to men who love the praise of men. Paul says, we did not come to you with a man-pleasing ministry. Some, indeed, do speak in order to receive the praise of men. And again, I think this is something that we can understand because due to our human nature and desire for approval inherently, and due to our sinful human nature, which desires every kind of approval that is illegitimate, it is not hard for us to imagine that someone would want to hear the praise of men. We all want to be approved. We all want to be accepted. We all want to be affirmed in one way or another. And one easy way to be affirmed and approved is to get up in front of people and to say something that they like. Even to say something that is true, you notice. Because Paul could have been brave. Paul could have been true. Paul could have been not deceptive, but, but giving them the honesty, and yet he still would have been pleasing men. That's the terrifying thing, I think, for the Christian. 
something that requires us to search our hearts as we live our lives in service to Jesus Christ. We can do all the right things. We can say all the right things. We can pray all of the right prayers. Are we doing it for the pleasure of other people? So other people will think well of us. So my mom will appreciate what I do. So my dad, so my husband, so my wife, so my church, my pastor will appreciate me. Is that why you're doing this? We ministers of the gospel, I think, suffer from this temptation, perhaps more than some. It's so easy to coast off of the fumes of the pleasantries and the compliments of the congregation. Do we live for the pleasure and praise of men, Christian? Ask yourself that question right now in your heart. Do I live for the glory that comes from men? This is an empty ministry an empty reality, an empty life, a vain life. But Paul gloriously says, this was not how I came to you, Thessalonians. How can you trust me? How can you trust Sylvanus and Timothy? How can you trust this gospel of Jesus Christ? Well, Paul tells them how by moving from these empty ministries and this contrast to showing them what a God-approved ministry looks like. And the first instance is, in contrast to being a man-pleasing ministry, this is a ministry that seeks the pleasure of God. Do you ever wonder what pleases God? Like, actually, what what pleases God? Is God some kind of static entity for you, some kind of principle? Or is is he reality? Is he a God who is pleased by some things and displeased by others? Paul says, as we live and move and have our being as ministers of the gospel, we are not seeking to please you, Thessalonians. We're not seeking to hear good things from you. We're not seeking to make a good reputation among you. We are seeking to please the almighty God in heaven. The God, he writes in verse 4, who tests our hearts. This is an interesting word, test. It's actually the same word that we find for approved when he says that we have been approved by God. And so we see in this range of the meaning for this word that it has a past and a present component within it. And this is true for Paul, but it's also true for the Christians generally speaking. In one sense, the Christian is a person who has been approved. Paul had been approved. How? He had been approved by God when he was called and changed and regenerated by God. You remember, he was called by God. He was an enemy, a wanderer, away from the truth. And God changed him and approved him for gospel ministry in life. He was approved by God. And yet, God still tests the hearts. The the Christian is one who is ever and always aware that that God knows what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling, more than even I do. Am I longing to live a God-approved life? A God-pleasing life? That's actually the core of what Paul is making in his defense. That is the chief evidence, exhibit number one, is that he's not seeking a a man-pleasing ministry, but he is seeking to please the God of the world the God who has presented this glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, and secondly, this God who has entrusted it to Paul. This is another reason why the Thessalonians could trust Paul and another reason why we can trust the word of God is because it doesn't come from an idea or a philosophy of man. It comes from the very lips of the Lord. Paul says, we were entrusted with them. It wasn't something that originated from within him. His preaching was God sent. So we see as he says that, that that gives him thirdly there a boldness to preach this gospel. A boldness that I think was evident before the Thessalonians. Otherwise, he wouldn't have brought it up. He says to the Thessalonians, you know what happened in Philippi. You know that we were beat up, thrown in jail. What do we do when we come to Thessalonica? We go to the streets and we proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
who died on a cross for sinners and was raised again for their justification. We preach that in the marketplace. We preach that in the synagogue. We preach that before the archegos, before the political leaders of Thessalonica, because it is the gospel of God and not the ideas of men. Paul preached boldly. But I think, particularly when he speaks about preaching boldly, he doesn't have in view, again, the boldness before the Thessalonians. Thessalonians saw boldness, but what was it a boldness of? That word for boldness, Paul typically only reserves that word for his boldness before the Lord. His confidence before God. I think that's actually ultimately the boldness that Paul has in view here. He says, Thessalonians, when you looked at me, you saw a man who was confident to stand before the living God. I've got nothing to hide. I've got plenty of sin. But it's been covered by the God who I preach to you. The God who has redeemed you from darkness. Who calls you into the kingdom of his light. Paul was bold before the Lord. He lived, as it it put it in the Latin, Coram Deo. Before the face of God. Before the presence of the Lord. And so he was not ashamed to speak. Because even when the authorities and even when the Jewish leaders and even when the crowds were stirred up against him, he, perhaps like Stephen, whom he stoned by his own hand, could look up and see the Lord. Christian, as you face persecution and rejection, that's the only thing that's going to keep you standing. When you look up, are you going to see the Lord there? Are you going to stand boldly? before him. But this isn't all that Paul talks about when a God-approved ministry, one that is God-pleasing, one that is God-entrusted, one that is bold before God. He gives also this interesting description. He says that when he came to them, when they came to them, not only were they not seeking glory that comes from men, not only were they pressing up, not pressing upon them their rights and demands as apostles, he says they were gentle. Gentle, or in some translations, it puts it, we were, we were like babes, infants. You can imagine the Apostle Paul, called by God, saw the Lord Jesus Christ, has the infallible word of God coming out of his pen, out of his mouth, and yet he says, we were like babies with you. We put on the kid gloves. We were gentle among you. And notice, particularly, he says, we were gentle among you like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. Why does Paul take up that language? I think it's because he understands that this is how God speaks about his people. Frequently in the Old Testament, even in the prophecies of Isaiah, God talks about how he is like a mother hen gathering in his chicks, or even like a mother carrying babies in his arms. Now God reveals himself as father. He is Father God, not Mother God, and yet God does not despise the imagery of a mother to show the intense, nurturing gentleness he has for his people. And Paul says, how do you know that this was a genuine God-approved ministry? Because we reflected the gentleness of God among you. A gentleness that was sacrificial. Moms, you know that. You have plenty of hopes, I'm sure, for your children, but... You have no guarantees, and yet you give, and you give, and you sacrifice. You you don't get the image in this this passage of of a mother who's smiling like a Madonna painting. She's just smiling at her little baby. No, get the image in your mind of a mother who's at three in the morning. She has three kids screaming. She's trying to nurse this baby, and yet she is gentle with her or gentle with him because she's affectionately desirous of them. She desires, she loves them. Paul says, we showed you the same love that God showed us and that God has for you. We were conduits of God's affectionate, desirous, gentle, caring love. That's how you know that we weren't just selling you a bill of goods. We were ready to share with you, Paul says, not just the gospel, not just words, as important as the gospel is, 
There is no gospel ministry without the proclamation of the gospel. And yet Paul says, we didn't just share the gospel, we lived it among you. We shared our own selves. The, the literal word there is our own souls with you. Our being, everything that we were, because you had become very dear to us. And he's not using hyperbole here, beloved. The Thessalonians were dear to Paul. Sometimes when we think about other Christians, we think about um, how they're uh, fun to be around or perhaps not so fun to be around. How we uh, enjoy meeting but would rather not meet more than once a week. Paul thought the Thessalonians dear. So did Timothy and so did Silas. And how? Why? Well, because they were dear to God. And that includes then or that explains, rather, why Paul goes on to say not only that he was gentle among them, but he was hardworking among them, laboring for them. You know, as Paul says here, again, he's talking about the denial of his own rights. Could Paul have come and made demands upon them? Actually, yes. And he still would have been fine. He would not have been breaching his ministry. He would, it would not have been false to Christ if he had come in and said, hey, I'm an apostle. I've got busy things to do. I've got lots to see and, and to take care of. Uh, can you give me this? Give me that. Set me up here. Set me up there. And in fact, as, as Jesus says, the laborer is due his wages. To take an Old Testament principle, you don't muzzle an ox while it's treading, right? You, you need to feed your ministers. I'm very grateful that you feed your minister here. And yet Paul says, we actually took that right and we sidelined it. There are men, there are men who serve in ministry without taking a cent. There are men and women who serve in the church, many of you. What is your return? What is your paycheck? You have full-time jobs. So did Paul. Paul says, I didn't want this to become a distraction. He knew that the situation in Thessalonica was fragile. He knew that there were many false teachers in their midst who were very happy to make a quick buck on these Thessalonians. And so Paul says, we're going to put our right to the side and we're going to work our tails off so that we can preach to you without any distraction, Paul says. So that you will know that we are holy, that we are preaching from sanctified motives. That's why Paul was hard working. Because he was holy. He was blameless and righteous. Now speaking in a human sense, of course Paul had his faults, but Paul is highlighting for us here that he is speaking as one who has been redeemed by Christ and who has been given now by the grace of Christ, godly motives in union with Christ. And that's a reality for every Christian who has been saved and renewed by the Holy Spirit, resurrected to spiritual new life. Our motives are changed. Ayn Rand was right to say that, that people are generally selfish. She was wrong to say that that's a good thing. In fact, naturally we may be selfish, but in Christ we are made new. We are a new man. We are new men and women in Christ. And we are given godly affections, godly desires, holy motivations and Paul highlights it for them not to brag but to give them confidence that the message they received was genuine and then finally what is this final mark that he gives of a God approved ministry not only was it God pleasing not only was it entrusted by God and bold before God and gentle towards God's people and hard working for God's people and holy in all things and motives but it was to the end of encouragement. Exhortation, encouragement. Paul uses a few different words here. Don't get the idea that he's coming just to give them a sweet little word that'll kind of get them on their way as they go about their day. No, he is encouraging in the sense of building them up. In other words, he preached to disciple the Thessalonians. Church is not a place for statues. It's a living temple. It's a place where we are built up, not just set down and static. And so Paul, recognizing this, said, you know, not just like a mother was I gentle with you, but like a father, I sought your development, Thessalonians, your maturity, 
your discipleship, your encouragement, your exhortation. I exhorted you. We exhorted you because we longed for you to grow into the faith that you had received. There is no sense of a God-approved ministry that is satisfied to say a prayer and then to live the way that you lived previously. And not maybe not so much now, but in previous generations, some of you may have even heard this before, this idea of having Jesus as your Savior, but not as your Lord, of living underneath the, the, the forgiveness of Christ and yet living however you want. That is not the picture that Paul has been given by the Lord for the Thessalonians. No, rather, he sees that there is a renovation project to be done that we all are participants in as Christians to be built up, as Paul says, to walk in a manner worthy of God. A manner worthy of God. It's just a strange phrase, and especially it can be a damaging phrase if we take it in the sense to mean that the Thessalonians are to walk so that God will approve of them. Remember, that approval has a past tense component. Paul has been approved, and in the same way, the Thessalonians who have put their faith in Christ have been approved, accepted. When God looks at them, he doesn't see their sins. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And yet Paul calls them to walk worthy. How are they going to do this? How did Paul do this? How did Paul get up and give a God-approved, serve in a God-approved ministry? Well, it was only by the grace of God. This is the, the real, I think, the real principle behind our passage, the one that we need to take away. Paul was not God-pleasing because one day he figured it out that he should be. Now, it was God's grace that had gripped him and changed him. A God-approved ministry is actually a work of God's own grace. Paul's proclamation, Silas's proclamation, Timothy's proclamation was a Christ-powered proclamation. It was Jesus at work in their lives. It was the same Jesus who died for Paul, who spoke through Paul for the good of those whom Paul was ministering to so that he would work in them as well. That's where this proclamation comes from. It comes from the power of Jesus Christ, the same power that raised him from the dead, God at work in him, the same spirit as we'll observe in this supper. The same spirit that indwelt Christ in his humanity. As mysterious as that may be, God indwelling God, that same spirit dwelt in Paul and he dwells in you, believer. To seal you for the day of redemption, to make you, to mark you, to stamp you, approved, accepted by the only one who's worth anything to be approved by and that is by God himself. God approved. It's not bad to want to have a good reputation if for no other reason than the fact that it is, makes for an effective witness. But when it comes to walking worthy, the fact of the matter is that we who have been brought into this grace are those who don't desire the pleasure and the praise and the glory of the people around us. If you're a person who struggles with this, not all of you do, I don't want to presume. Some of you have this figured out. But if you are a person who struggles with the opinions of men, what people think of you, what they say about you, how they perceive you, whether online or in person, I charge you with this. Throw yourself into the grace that gripped the Apostle Paul. The grace that allowed him to say, I don't care that I was a Pharisee. I don't care that I kept the law. I don't care that I had wealth and status before my fellow Jewish leaders. I count it as loss for the sake of knowing Jesus Christ. I don't know if I've mentioned, I know I've mentioned this man before. I don't know if I've mentioned this quote before, but... There was a Scottish uh, Presbyterian minister named Samuel Rutherford. He lived a very interesting life. He was around at the Westminster Confession when the, the documents that formed the, the constitution of our church were, were drawn up. 
in the 17th century. He was there. He served and he ministered and he had great gospel success and he had great setbacks. He was a man of many blessings and many graces and also many faults. But like all men, there was a day when Rutherford knew he was going to die. And it was as he was laying in his deathbed, as he was talking to other gospel ministers around him, men that he had served with, men that he loved, and as he also looked to his family, he said these words, My Lord and Master is chief of 10,000 of thousands. None is comparable to him in heaven or in earth. Dear brothers, do all for him. Pray for Christ. Preach for Christ. Do all for Christ. Beware of men pleasing. The chief shepherd will shortly. That was quite some time ago. The chief shepherd will shortly appear. Samuel Rutherford lived before the presence of God, boldly before him. For him, his days were short, but his time in eternity would be long. He was convicted and convinced that the chief shepherd would soon appear. What if he appeared this moment, this day, this hour, would he find us as a church walking worthy? Would he find you, Christian, walking worthy to what God has called you to into his own kingdom and for his own glory? Pray, preach, do all for Christ. That was Paul's conviction by the grace of his Lord and Master who he knew was the chief of ten thousands of thousands. And by the same grace, let it be yours. And now, Father, we do pray a word of thanksgiving and a word of supplication, thanking you for the gospel ministers that you have put in our lives, for the apostles and prophets who at such great cost proclaimed not their own ideas, but the very word that comes from your mouth, a word that you say is like fire that breaks a rock like water that washes over and renews and restores our souls. So we pray that it would yield a fruitful increase in us, and that you would make us those who walk worthy of the calling that you have placed upon us. All of this we do pray in Jesus' name. Amen.